Welcome to Impact and Let's Cheer. Right, 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 right. Settle down. That's what I want to do, right? Um, I am so excited about this sermon series. We get excited about it every year. We recorded it. It's been in the past called Blockbuster Summer, but this year we're talking Impact and Chill because I think we run and rip and run so much we don't ever have a chance to just chill. Just push your neighbor and tell them, just chill. Yeah, I want to sing the whole song. I know y'all want to do I know y'all want to do it. Not yet. We'll wait until the BET Awards section of the service. We ain't going to do that, y'all. No ratchetness. Righteousness, but not ratchetness. Amen. All right, so I want to get into the scripture. Uh, I want to read. This is the first time I'm reading scripture, actually, this Impact and chill, but I think the scripture just needs to be read just a little bit. Um, Mark chapter 17, Mark chapter 10, I'm sorry, verse 17. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Teacher, you are essentially and perfectly morally good. What must I do and inherit eternal life? That is to partake of eternal salvation in the Messiah's kingdom. Push to somebody, tell them, I need access. Mm. Isn't that a problem? Oftentimes, it, you, you want to be in the right rooms where the right people make the right decisions. Do I got about 30 of y'all in here that want access to some things? Glory to God. Glory to God. Sometimes, sometimes that's the issue, right? Sometimes access is the issue. Like, you know, hey, you, you're someplace and you're on the internet and all of a sudden your, your Roman stops roaming. And then you're trying to get on, because there are some restaurants that I go to, some in St. Clair Shores, some in Gross Point, that I'll go to these restaurants. And when I get to the restaurants, I'm trying to do some work, and I sit there and I'm trying to do work, but there's no signal. So then I ask them, do you have Wi-Fi? And they'll say, yes. I say, well, can I get access? Because just because you have Wi-Fi doesn't automatically mean you have access. So there is something to tap into if I have the password. Okay. So as we're looking at this text, this young man is coming to Jesus saying, listen, I'm trying to connect, but I don't have the password. Can you give it to me? And then Jesus, because that's what the skit kind of produces, right? The skit kind of tells you the story of this from a different perspective. It, it puts it in a modern spin on it. They're asked, they're, they want this access, but then they're saying to him, he says to Jesus, I want this. I want access to the Messiah's kingdom. And Jesus starts quizzing him on some basic principles. He says, how do you treat people? Do you, can you keep the commandments? The young man says, yes, I can keep the commandments. Then he asks him, are you willing to do the tough thing? What's the tough thing? The tough thing is simply this. Can you take everything that you have already accrued, sell it all, and then give that to the charity? And the young man doesn't even respond. He just walks away. He was given a choice between excess and access. Because the Bible says that this young man, I'm done. Take this from me. This young man says to, to him, nothing. And then walks away. The disciples say to Jesus, what happened? Jesus says, the young man really, he, what he said on the way out the door was, I got way too much to give up. That is kind of the story of Ghost in power. He's at this crossroads throughout the entirety of the series where he wants to come out of the stuff he was in. He was a drug dealer. He, he did wrong. He made money. He accrued money and wanted to be legit. And the struggle was always there because he could not give up the power. And I believe this young man who Jesus was talking to, it wasn't just the money. It was all the trappings of that lifestyle. It ain't just money. People, people will try to boil it down to it just, it was just money. No, it was more than just money. 
it was all the living that that money brought. That's what the prodigal son endured. The Bible says when he got his money, he went out to, he traveled. He went to a foreign place. He spent all his money. The Bible said on riotous living. He was living his best life. I ain't going back to forth with you. So, so the young man that came to Jesus pondered for a moment. He said, I got so much excess. Do I really need the excess? Because this money gives me things. What does money do? Money gives me attention. Because with, with money, I can dress a certain kind of way. I can get attention. See, some folk might not aesthetically look good, but you put them in enough gold and silver and bling and, 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 and shoes and all of the right trappings, even flavor flavor to some ladies. New York, concrete jungles. See, see, even that, when you dress somebody up in wealth, they become a whole lot more attractive. So those are some of the, that's one of the trappings. It's, it's do I want to give up looking wealthy? Money gives you influence. Because there's certain folk that, that, you know you got them cousins. You don't like, but because they got money you like. Oh, so, okay, okay, they want to, oh, y'all want to, y'all want to act funny on me now, right? Y'all want to act as though you never been like that, that somebody who got some money come around, all of a sudden you perk up. Hey, cuz, let's get a picture, cuz, how that house, cuz, cuz invited us to the house. You don't even know cuz name. All you know is cuz is rich. Cuz got them stacks. So you, you, your money gives you, it gives you aesthetics. It gives you influence. It gives you riz. I see some of y'all even know what that is. That means you got game. That's that's the new lingo for you got game. You got game. You got game. Now you man, you got game when you got money. Money give you game. You pull up in the right car, you got game. You ain't got to open your mouth. Because that's what money in our minds does for us. Money validates us. You get the right house, you can brag about it. You invite nobody to your duplex. But the moment you got on 30 Mile and Van Dyke, you invite people you don't even like. We having a cookout. You ain't never cooked nothing. Now all of a sudden you've arrived and now you want to flaunt what you have because you want to yield or wield that power over people. There's some people that are dominant when they have money. They couldn't make their own dog pee outside before they got money. But now because they got money, they think they got influence. Because they got money, they think they got power. Because they got money, they think they're above the law. You can get away. You, you watch power. You see so much. Everybody trying to get up, get over, and 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 murder, and and hide, and do all of these things that sin does. Because that's how the enemy tricks you. He tricks you to make you think you need that kind of power. That you need worldly power. That you need to be somebody. That you got to give up the facade of who you are. And this young man was going back and forth in his mind saying, I know what eternal life is. I know that what God wants to give me is bigger than what I have, but I don't want to give up what I have to get that. And we think it's, it's crazy in our minds to think that he would just give it up for Jesus. But ask your neighbor, what have you given up for Jesus? You ain't even want to say that because you ain't want them to ask you that question. What are you willing to give up for Jesus? What have you given up for Jesus? To quote Janet Jackson, 
What have you done for him lately? Well, I gave Jesus my life. Did you really? Because if I look at your life and examine all of the DMs you slide into, all of the times you get off the phone with somebody, you cuss them out after you get off the phone with them because you're two-faced. All of the lies and all the cheating that you do that you don't think nobody knows, but God, that's the life you gave him. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just wondering, do we really know the cost? Because there is one, there's one thing, there's the cost. Everybody say cost. And then there's the benefit. Everybody say benefit. Cost and Okay, so Jesus outlines to him the cost. I know you know what you're supposed to do. You can quote me the scripture. Many of you can quote scripture probably better than me. Maybe. You can quote all kinds of scriptures and give all kinds of biblical references. But if I ask you, do you live what you know? How does that price look to you now? It's one thing to quote scripture. It's another thing to live it. It's one thing to know the Bible. It's another to reflect the Bible that you know. He asked him, do you understand the Ten Commandments? I'll put no other God before thee. That's one of the Ten Commandments, right? I'll put no other God before me unless it's my job. I'll put no other God before me unless it's my family. I'll put no other God before me unless it's somebody else's man. How can you be one when you're satisfied with being number two? How can, you, how can he ever have your back if you're always on his side? <sighs> so you know the scripture, but you're not living it. You know what Jesus expects, but are you willing to do it for your own salvation? Because this was a personal uh, uh, conversation that Jesus was having with this young man, this one man. He was having a conversation back and forth. He was having a, a conversation with him and a discussion with him. And when he was talking to him, he was letting him know, I know you know the Bible. You know how to get access. But are you willing to get access? And when Jesus says, I need you to take everything you have, all the status, all the money, and if we put it in today's terms, the vehicles, the businesses, the stocks, the crypto, the cars, put it all on Marketplace, all on eBay, sell it all. Trust me enough to give it to who I say give it to. Trust me enough that you'll get more than that if you do this. And what he said was, I don't trust that power. I trust this power. I don't trust power I can't see. I, trust, I only trust power I can see. And how many of us are guilty of that? The only thing we trust is what we see. The only thing we trust is the, the, the all I know, pastor, is how much money is in my bank account. But God knows how much he can add to it. All I know, pastor, is what my doctor tells me. But what I know is I know the doctor that made 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 the doctor. So my trust cannot be in the things of the world. Because if I put my trust in the things of the world, then I'm saying that it is more stable than God's word. And this young man... He had a lot of stuff. The Bible says he had many things and did not want to give up those things. 
to get the one thing he didn't have. He walks away. Sad. Jesus turns to the disciples. He says, see, he had too much, he had too many things. Peter, you know, because Peter's outspoken. You know, if, if anybody gonna say something, it's gonna be Peter. Like, Master, what's, what's going on? Jesus said, it is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. It is easier. So I have to give you some, you know, informational understanding the eye of the needle thing because we merely think it means literally the eye of the needle. It could mean literally the eye of the needle, but the eye of the needle was the entryway into Jerusalem. It was a, an entrance that was only yea tall. So when the camel would be led, which was a beast of burden, would be led to the gateway, the eye of the needle, it, it could not get through the entrance because it had too much stuff. It was packed with too much. So the camel had to kneel down outside of the gate and they would have to unload all of the extra stuff, set it to the side, then allow the camel to get back up and lead him through the gate, through the eye of the needle, and then take all of the stuff, carry it through the entrance, and reload him as he got into the city. You don't even want to unload for a moment. It wasn't that you had to give up everything forever. You just needed access. Don't walk away from the door where all you got to do was unload at the door. If I could just, if, if, if the rule is take your shoes off before, but you say, I paid too much money for these shoes then you don't want access to the, you don't want entrance to get access. So he says that if the, if the camel can't get through the eye of the needle unless it lets some stuff go. But if it lets some stuff go, once it gets through the eye of the needle, it'll be able to get more. So the disciples Look and tell Jesus that Jesus, this looks impossible. And Jesus says, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. I just had an aha moment. I just had an aha. I preached this text so many times. I had an aha moment. Here's what Jesus just told you. He just told you this. He said he had, the, he had the knowledge, but he didn't have the God. He came to Jesus without receiving Jesus. Because he did not have God. He had church. But he didn't have God. He had a position. But he didn't have God. He had a title. Apostle, bishop, potentate, prelate, I taught you last week, prime eight, archbishop, duke, duchess, bishop elect, elder elect, minister elect. People have all these titles, but no God. And with no God, no power, no real power. The only power that some people have is the power of manipulation. Not, not real leadership, because real leadership is influence. Fake leadership, counterfeit leadership is manipulation. If I have to be in a relationship with someone that chooses to manipulate me, I choose not to be in that relationship. So this young man was like, I can't do it. They walk away. Peter turns to Jesus and says, who can get through this? Jesus says, if he had God, he would get access. But because he did not choose the God that chose him, he walked away 
in defeat. And he went back to the power that he thought he needed. Ghost. Every time he would try to move forward, the streets would always bring him back because he always had ties with the streets. He had ties with Tommy. He had ties with people from his background. He had ties with his ex-girlfriend. He had ties with all these people, and he never wanted to leave his, his people behind. But because he had a conflict with his past, he could never enjoy his present. He could not enjoy his kids. Tariq and Raina and Yasmin, he could not enjoy his kids, right? Because he was still in love, lust, with his ex. And the ghost of his past was the last thing he saw. (laughs) Because he couldn't bury his past. He could not walk away from those things that he felt gave him power. And that's us. What have you left to walk into God? You can't get real access if you don't leave. I know this is not one of them run up to the church and high five everybody. I know it's not that sermon, but it's the sermon that you needed. Because you have stayed in powerless situations thinking that it was giving you power. You stay with that person longer than you should have because you didn't want to be alone. But you can do bad. Real power has to be taken. It has to be seized. Real access has to be possessed. But he was not willing to possess the real access because he was not willing to walk away from his past. Just like Ghost. He was a product of his past. All of those things that he did, and and he's trying to move, every time he tried to move forward, running for Lieutenant Gun, every time he tried to move forward, something from his past kept pulling him back. And Jesus says, listen, if you want real access, I need you to leave all of the trappings behind. And if you choose this, there's something great for you. He didn't even let Jesus finish the conversation. He finishes the conversation with the disciples because as he's talking to the disciples, he's telling them, no rich man can, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It is like a camel trying to get through the eye of the needle. I gave you that analogy. Then he says to them, he says, with God, it's possible. Peter, being Peter, doing Peter things. Peter be peeking. Peter tells him, He says, well, Lord, we done left mother and father and houses and land and all of, we done done what he he wouldn't do. We with God, you're Emmanuel, God with us. We're with you. We did all of this. What do we get? Now, some of y'all would be like, how dare they ask Jesus what's in it for them? How dare they want to know what's in it for them? If you don't want to know, you crazy. If I'm going to give it all up, I do want to know what I'm getting if I give it all up. Because Jesus, listen, it's okay to find out what's in it for you. Can I tell you, probably that's one of the biggest mistakes that you make. You never know what decisions will lead to. What results follow your decisions. You know, people don't tell you what's in it for you. Unless you ask them, what's in it for me? If I do this for you, people will be like, well, you're supposed to be saved. Just because I'm saved don't mean I'm stupid. Now, if it's my brother and he needs me, I will go two miles if he asks me to go one. If you ask me for my coat, I'll give you my coat, my jacket, and my vest. I'll give you all of it. But I'm saying... There are some some moments you need to ask, if it's a big sacrifice, what is in it? What what is in it for me? If I do this, what do I get? Because you about to get all this benefit. What do I get? You get 10%. Well, at least I can make the decision. 
So the disciple Peter's like, Jesus, if I do this thing, if we already did it, we decided it wasn't a money thing for us. It was a Jesus thing for us. And he said, nobody. Push on somebody, tell them that means you. He said, nobody who will give up houses, land, relationships for my sake. They, houses, lands, bank accounts, relationships for Jesus. Not, not because you had a dream and you just wanted to do it. But no, when God requires it of you. In other words, when you are willing to give God your yes, despite of the cost. He said, no one who does that, no one who is willing to live a life with me will ever be empty. What does he say? He says, no one having done that will not receive a hundredfold blessing in this world and in the world to come. So what the young man didn't understand was he thought he had to trade his, his human life for an eternal life. He thought he had to exchange all of these riches in the earth for riches that he can't see. But Jesus came back and told the disciples, had he just finished the story, had he not left in the middle of the movie, had he not getting distracted with what he had at home, he would have heard the whole concept. And the whole concept was no one who was willing to do that, who is willing, willing, to do that. If you be willing and eat it, be obedient, you'll eat of the good of the land. Isaiah 119. No one who is willing to do that will be disqualified from receiving a hundred times more than what they have in this earth and in the earth to, in the world to come. So I, I listen, if I'm willing to give it all up, I don't have to lose it all. We think that the essence of being saved is being broke. The devil is a lie. If I be willing and obedient, I'll eat of the good of the land. That's scripture. Give and it shall be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That is scripture. If any two of you can agree as touching, I will be there in the midst of my father will give you whatever you pray for. That is is the benefit of being saved. If you be willing and obedient to earnestly hear the voice of the Lord, to observe, to do all the commands you to do, Deuteronomy 28 and 1, then God said, I will elevate you. That same person who I elevate, I will command the blessing to not only find you, but overtake you. I had to tell one of my spiritual sons this week, I said, man, the problem is you're not commanding the blessing. That's the problem. You've been so quiet about commanding. We, we get that way. We get so inundated with doing the work of ministry that we forget that we got benefits. I want to shout. Man, God, thank you, Holy Spirit. We need to be reminded. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul, forget not one of his benefits. And we forget the benefits. If we, if we decide to get access to Christ, there are benefits that should be with us. They will drink poison but won't die. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. They will cast out demons. It, you got access, but you haven't made entrance. You have not gained entrance into your excess because of your excess. I'm say that again. You have not gained interest, entrance to your excess because you have excess. But if you could ever put your excess in the proper 
context. Money serves me. I don't serve money. Resources serve me. I don't sweat for money. That's, that's when you're out of covenant that you're supposed to sweat by the brim of your head. That's when you're out of covenant that you're supposed to toil in the earth. But the Bible tells me that I'm not supposed to toil because I'm in covenant. This young man, he didn't let Jesus finish the story, but Peter heard it all. Peter got to hear it all because Jesus says to him, he says, you get a hundred times more here and later. The blessing here and eternally. That the blessing is going to follow you, it's going to overtake you, it's going to chase you down, it's going to hunt you down, and you're going to find the favor of God finding you. You will find yourself in pursuit of miracles, signs, and wonders. I'm sorry, you will find yourself being pursued by miracles, signs, and wonders. If, if you are willing, let's say you have to, but you have to be willing to lose it all. If you're willing to lose it all, you'll never lose anything. If you're willing to lose it all, you will never lose anything. Why? Because God is more for you than every creditor could be against you. I had an epiphany last night. So last night I'm going through and I'm, I, I've got a letter in the, in the mail. I was like, look at the debt. I was like, where did this debt come from? And I was shook for about 35 seconds. Literally, I was shook. I was like, man, I'm just tired. Not shook. I, I was disturbed. I was irritated by that. I'm like, man, every time I'm trying to move forward, something else is coming. And, and then I thought, and my God shall supply. I got access to the benefits. So, so I stopped worrying. I mean, I, I sleep good at night. Because I might get shook during the day, but, but my wife tells you, I sleep good. I, I sleep good at night. I, I don't struggle with, sleep, oh, with being awake because of problems. And I'm telling you, we've had some major challenges over 26 years in ministry. Major challenges. But they would come to get shut everything. They were shutting everything off. I mean, I, we, I, there was service. I was sitting in service like, Lord, if we can just make it through this service, please don't have nobody cutting nothing off at the pole. I'm, I am for real. Like, Lord, if you can just work it. But my wife, she, she says this all the time. She says, God always works it out. God always works it out. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. We are the seed of Abraham, y'all. Why are we still tricking and begging? I'm sorry. Begging and tricking. Whoop that trick. Stop, stop, stop allowing that to be your mantras. Stop allowing that to be your default. That you figure you got to manipulate the situation to be able to get through. But God's got so much favor that if he just allows, if you just allow yourself to come into alignment with him and not rely on the power of the world, but the power from God, everything you need. Somebody yell everything. Y'all didn't yell it. I said yell it. Everything that you need is at your disposal. Everything that you need, deliverance is at your disposal. Supernatural debt cancellation, it ain't nothing but somebody typing up a letter for you. It's just the cost of postage. Lord, I just speak that. How much is postage these days? How much? 70 cents. I prophesy over y'all that somebody's about to start spending 70 cents to tell you you're debt free. Who believes that? Who believes that? Who believes that? Who believes that? It's only going to cost them 
an initial 70, that 70 cents is about to shut down some debt. That 70 cents is going to send that letter to tell you that you're healed. That 70 cents is going to be that letter that's going to tell you you just got hired. That 70 cents is going to overturn your last denial letter. That 70, it's less than a dollar. Tell them my benefits is greater than a dollar. I have an expectancy. I, I expect some movement. I, I expect this summer, I expect some movement. I expect people to call me to tell me yes. I expect people to call me and tell me I'm qualified. I expect it. Why? Because I was willing to throw away everything and sell everything I have. I'm willing to do that if Jesus tells me to do that. So if I'm willing and obedient, I'll eat of the good of the land. So I'm believing God for a, I believe that this is the season of a hundredfold return. Of a hundred times. I, I, heard, I just heard this word. I'm not preaching this, preaching the movie this year, but I just heard it. Boomerang. I, I hear there's something coming back at you. As hard as you threw, threw what you needed to leave away. God said something is about to start. It's on its way back. Who am I talking to in the room today that, I, that believe that something is about to hit you? Something is about something major. Something major. You expect the God to do something major. I need to prophesy. Something major is about to happen. I feel it. I feel it in the room. I feel it in the room. Something major is about to happen. Something major is about to happen. Something major is about to happen. And, and maybe the reason why you can't see it is because you're still looking at the things you already got. But faith is not falling in love with what you see. It's by being hungry for what you can't see. I'm driven by what I can't see. I'm driven by the vision of this room being packed wall to wall. I'm driven by that. Why? Because that means somebody's family got saved. That means somebody's household has been delivered. Church is being full is what God expects. The devil tried to tell you, church don't need to be big. Every church should be full. There should, and listen, there should be 20 mega churches in the city of Detroit. Why? Because it's 20 mega churches full of people in these streets that need to be filled in these churches. Well, pastor, uh, you know, if we get bigger, that means that God is blessing. I'm tired of feeling like we got to scrimp and struggle to be God's kids. We're the children of the most high God. Not the medium, Jesus is extra large. And we serve him. Well, we should serve him. At the end of the day, that was the question. Will you be like ghosts and die living in two worlds? Or will you be like the disciples? so anointed that when they walk down the street, people drug their couches into the streets just to get a touch of their shadows. So anointed that nobody had need in their community because the Bible says when one had, they all had. They had a spirit of collaboration that was different than anything else we've ever seen in the Bible. My challenge to you is, what is that thing that's holding you back from being powerful? What is that thing in your past that you just can't let go? Who is that Miss Thing in your past, Mr. Thing in your past that you just can't let go? That's really got a hold on you. Who told you you could never be great? What word curse are you holding on to so tight that you can't hold on to the word blessing? I break every word curse over your life. If 
you are believing that this is about to be the change moment, the transformational moment, the instance where you shift from what was impossible to what was possible.